So this is a little tutorial on make files. It's intermediate and I'm really making it for myself because I've been needing to use make files for these projects that I'm working on for school and it was really a pain for me to try and figure out how to make them work in the way that I wanted to because you're always having to list a whole bunch of O files up here and a whole bunch of .cpp files up here and things and I just wasn't down with that, wasn't happy. So I read the manual for a while because I could not find the tutorials to tell me what I wanted to do and I finally figured out how to do it. So I'm making this tutorial for myself in the future to remember and I thought I'd share it for anybody else who wants to know also. So, um, it, please excuse me if there's any sound in the background. I'm at school in the lab right now and if I stumble, which I'm for sure going to do because this is the first time I've done it over, um, Please just ignore it. Okay, so here I am in Vim, and I wanted to show you the make file that I have. Now, the reason I say this is intermediate is because I'm not going to explain the basics of Vim, because you can read up on that. There are a lot of tutorials on that. But uh, also, it's not all that super advanced, and I'm also doing some cheaty things that uh, real diehards would tell you not to do, because they could create some problems in specific circumstances. But this is like a good enough get or done version of the of the make file for me that I'm using with my project and, and I'm happy with it. So starting from the beginning, um, here are just my comments, my comment blocks to make it visually nice to be able to see what's going on. Um, here I'm setting variables. Now this is interesting. The dot equals, I read up in the manual, and make has two different kinds of variables. There are recursive variables, or in other words, variables that when they expand, which means come in here and take the text that's inside of here and make it static text, that when they expand, if there are any variables inside of the variable definition, it expands those first. So it goes in, expands all the other vari variables that are in there, and if there are any variables in there, it expands those. So you get a recursive expansion of all your variables to get a variable in the end. And every time you call that variable, it does it. With, that's with a normal equal sign, okay? So this is not what I was just telling you about. This is the wrong way to, to say the tutorial. But I was just telling you about recursive expansion, which is what happens with a default only equals sign. Now, I use colon equals, which is not recursive e expansion for variables, because uh, you can imagine that recursive expansion can be slower, can take longer, and it can also give you results that maybe you weren't wanting. Um, in this case, I only needed whatever I set inside of this variable at the time to be expanded once. That's all I wanted. So here I say CPPs, in all caps, just for a naming convention for variables. Colon equal means not recursive. And then inside of the parentheses, I put a shell command. Okay, now this is, this is actually a function. So if you look down here, you can define a variable without parentheses just by typing normal text and that is the default way to define a, a variable. But you, when you call a variable, you use a dollar sign inside of, and then your text, your variable name inside of parentheses. Um, and also, the same syntax is used for calling functions that are built into VAM, like this shell function. So here, I say cpps equals, and then this is going to expand this function for me. So I, I say, run this in a shell, and then I type this command, ls, and if you'll, I'm not going to show it to you, but uh, my source directory is set up with folders, which is pretty default, to have all my source CPP files in a source directory, and all of my H files in an include directory, and then this make file is in the root directory of that folder, right? So, so make file is sitting at root of the folder, and then CPP, all my CPPs are going to be in source slash whatever.cpp, just like you can see here, etc. So, here we go. Shell ls source slash dot cpp. This is going to give me a long list of all of my cpp files that are inside of source. Now, make is cool because it'll run that shell command and then any hard returns it sees in the output, it'll just convert to spaces. And make works with its variables by spaces. So make knows that even though this is one long string, with every space, this is going to be a different object it can work on or a different uh, thing it can iterate over. So 
This essentially, this whole command right here, makes cpps equal to a space delineated list of my cpp files, which which will come out source slash test dot cpp source slash page dot cpp whatever I have in there, it'll expand it to. Now. When I'm building my program, I want to make a .o file out of all of my .cpp files. And I don't want to have to list all of those automatically. So, I'm sorry, manually. So what I did here was I created a temp variable because in make you cannot assign a variable to itself. I can't say, uh, for example, cpps equals cpps plus bob. It just doesn't work that way. So I made a temp variable and once again I do the normal the non-recursive assignment right there and then here's another function subst and what this does is it says substitute source or I'm sorry substitute obj for source in cpps so I give it a string what I from and then a string to so source slash I want to change to obj slash slash in this variable cpps Okay, so this is going to expand this. It's going to say, oh, okay, for every occurrence of src slash in the string, I'm going to change it to obj slash. So now temp is full of um, files that are obj slash main.cpp, obj slash page.cpp, etc. So you can tell we're not quite done yet. So here's the obj's variable, and this does the same subs again but instead it replaces all .cpp occurrences with .o inside of temp. So I just made a little daisy chain there. And that gives me, inside of obj's, a list of my prospective .o files. Or in other words, a list of all of the files that end with .o that, that don't exist yet, but that I will want to make. And this is great because I'll make those a target, and then when make sees that they aren't created, it'll go and do what it takes to create those. So it's important that I have a list of those .o files that I want to create, okay? And then headers are always important, so I do the same thing, shell, list, what's inside of include, headers, and I will use those in a minute. Okay, then I set a variable equal to where I want my executable to be, and then I've been doing unit testing on the on the big program that I'm building right now, so I explicitly said make a oh I'm explicitly explicitly listing here um, some of the .o files that I'm using for my test .cpp because I need to make specific um, .o files to involve inside of when I'm compiling my test .cpp. Once again, sorry for the stumbling. This is the first time I've explained this. So. That's the reason I have that defined, and you'll see it in a second. Now, pseudo targets you should know about are the option to be able to just take a word and have that depend on some set of files. So this pseudo target here is called test, and it just depends on the exe file. So basically, if this exe file doesn't exist, um, when I call test, it will come down to this rule right here. So Remember that with make, this is a target and this is the dependency. So always the target is made at. A dependency is always updated before the target is. So if this is, if the resulting file from the dependency is newer by timestamp than the target file, then the target file will have to be rebuilt. And so here you'll see, down here in the supplementary targets, that. This is the way that we can build this file right here. So, if bin test isn't there, we're going to go make it. So here we have bin test as a target, and then the dependencies for that, or what it depends on, are my testing objects, or in other words, the .o files that I need for my test, okay, that I need to make this executable, and the header files. I just said include all the headers, because I'm working on a small enough project, I don't care if I rebuild every time a header is changed, okay? Here's my compile command. Now don't forget to make an include file, an include uh, flag for the includes folder so that we can include our .h's in our compile. Same thing with, I, I have a utilities folder with some uh, classes that I've downloaded from my 
CSS, or my CSS, I'm sorry, my CS class here at uh, BYU. So I have them inside of there, so I have two includes. Then I include all of my testing objects because this is going to compile all of those together. Uh, that's all of those .o files. And then my output file is my desired. There it is, my desired executable name, all right? And then I say run it. So basically, this, when I call make test, it goes and makes the exe. First, it'll make these things if it needs to, then it makes the exe, and it does that by running this command, and then it uh, runs the program for us, okay? So, now to get a little bit more specific, um, I took the test.o, which is needed for the testing executable, and I said test.o depends on headers, because I have um, a class that's all inside of the header file that doesn't have a .o file, because it's a template. So I included the headers because I have some .h files that don't have accompanying .cpp files. So here, I made a more specific rule that says, if you're building test.o, make sure that that depends on headers. So if I update one of the headers, then test.o has to be rebuilt. Okay? Okay. So now this is a really interesting part. We're almost done. We come down to patterns. This is a very general pattern that tells make anytime you come across uh, a file that starts with obj slash and ends with dot o, I want you to make it depend on its equivalent file that starts with src and dot cpp, ending with dot cpp, and run this, uh, this recipe on it. Okay? So, it took me a minute to understand this, but what this means is I come from the top and it's, I run make test and it says, okay, well, let me check to see if test exe is there. Oh, it's not? Okay. Uh, well, test exe first is going to check testing objects and headers. So, in order to make this, I have to check and make sure its dependencies are done. Testing objects. Oh, okay. Well, let me test. Oh, there's no rule for that. It sees there's no rule to say what testing objects depends on. But there is a pattern rule down here. And so it looks up to testing objects, which is right here. And it goes to the first one. Okay, obj slash page dot o. Oh. Does that match this pattern? obj slash percent dot o? It does. So what it's going to match here is just the word page. So basically it takes this block of text and it says that the target is obj slash page dot o. And then it substitutes page right here for this percent. So it says this depends on source slash page dot cpp. Wow! Oh, so there's a rule that makes all of our dot o files, or all of our things that are in the obj folder and end with dot o, all of those depend on a counterpart that is in the source folder and ends in dot cpp. Cool! So if my source dot cpp file is newer with its timestamp than my obj my equivalent obj slash dot o file run this command this command compiles it g plus plus dash wall include write all that normal stuff and then dash c is for compiling only so this is just building dot o files and then these are cool little variables this variable right here represents anything that's to the right of the colon or any de all of the dependencies so this, this is just a make pattern variable. So it says, oh, okay, anything to the right of the colon, I'm going to substitute for this. And then this one, dollar sign at, represents anything that's on the left, or a target, in other words. So basically, this is a valid compile command that says compile flags, and then feeds in source slash page, for this example, .cpp right here, and then dash o obj slash o so obj slash page dot o and it does that for every thing that it matches so it, it'll use this pattern for any time it matches one of these now if you need to um, you can make it more specific you can make a rule that's more specific than this pattern which is what I did right here and that will take priority so it says even though this matches this pattern I'm gonna go with, with this one to make sure that obj slash test finds the attention it needs by depending upon the headers, okay? Whew, we're almost done.
in the end we have this dot phony in all caps colon test this needs to be here for any phony targets that uh, have the same name as a folder in your directory and it it can even be for targets but don't share the same name it's kinda safe to just list any phony targets right here so you don't end up confusing make so basically if you make a pseudo target like test or build or run or bin right uh, make sure you list them as a phony target and that you do just by listing it afterwards with the space so those are all my phony targets that's just how it works so there's my intermediate tutorial for make and I hope it was helpful